All right. Next video. Next video. Electrospray ionization. Okay. This is an ionization source that's used to connect liquid chromatography to mass spec. Right? So here we go. All right. Because it is a it is a excuse me. Because we're using it to connect liquid chromatography to mass spec, this ionization method is one of the most important techniques for biomolecules analysis. Okay, so if you do analysis of proteins, all right, you will very likely do it by LCMS. All right, okay. Uh, biomolecules that have, you know, molecular weights greater than or equal to $100,000. Typically done using this method. Okay. If you're really cool, instead of saying electrospray ionization, you just call it ESI. Okay. That's what all the cool cats do. All right. Very quickly, I'm going to draw a schematic so that you can kind of see how these things look. Okay, so we have an outer housing that has an inlet in the base, all right, for a drying gas. Okay, this is not the same as a reagent gas for chemical ionization. It's a drying gas, all right? different substance. Inside that, you have essentially a long cyl cylinder, okay, with the, the, that functions as an electrode, okay? So it's a cylindrical electrode. All right. And into that cylindrical electrode, we have a needle. Okay. And the electrode and the needle would not be touching because that would cause a short. Okay. Because these two components, the needle and the electrode, are held at a very, very high potential difference, okay? So the difference in the potential, okay, between the needle and that electrode is on the order of kilovolts, okay? Kilovolts. So thousands of volts difference between these two elements, okay? Into that, we pump our sample, okay, all right, with a flow rate of a few microliters per minute. All right, it's not terribly fast, okay? What this does is it creates droplets, large droplets, at the end of the needle, okay? And those droplets are going to be charged because of that potential difference. And because of the drying gas, those droplets will eventually get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, all right, until the charge is transferred to the analyte, okay? And then on this side here, we will have our mass spec in. All right, so we get ionized analyte passing into the instrument. Okay, so this happens, okay, this happens 
kind of like this, right? We have our analyte molecules. We have some charges that have been picked up by the solvent, okay? And over time, we're going to get solvent evaporation. So the, the droplet will get smaller and smaller and smaller until it hits a particular point. And this is called the Raleigh limit. Okay? So now the droplet is so small that it cannot support this charge density anymore. And it will burst into even smaller droplets, okay, that have split the charge, okay? We call that splitting, that division, okay, that division process is given a very dramatic name. It's called a coulombic. explosion all right and essentially all that's saying is that the charge density is so great that the charges force each other apart until the droplet just explodes okay and that will happen again and again and again and again all right until we end up with a bunch of analyte molecules All right, that have our charges. Now you'll notice that in this set here, I've drawn analytes with multiple charges. Okay? And that's because in electrospray ionization, due to this process, we can have, okay, we can have analytes. multiply charged okay now what kind of effect would this have let's consider a molecule Okay, that has a molecular weight of 10 million Daltons. Okay. Right. Or our mass to charge. Ugh. Forgive the fact that that axis is very wobbly, right? We will see some, if our mass spec can handle it, we will see some peak all the way out here at 10 million, right? Because that is the singly charged form, right? But we'll also see something at 5 million, because that is M++. And we'll also see something over here at 3 million because that's m plus 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 and so on and so forth so you can see that having multiple charge states can really affect what our mass spectrum looks like all right so that will cover all of molecular spectroscopy for us all right now we're going to move on to chromatography. Okay. Now chromatography is essentially a a separation method. Okay. We can separate analytes in a mixture. We can separate analytes from interference, okay? 
Um, but it's, it's all about separation. All right. So what we do is we dissolve the analyte, right? We dissolve the analyte. in a mobile phase. Okay? We dissolve the analyte in a mobile phase. And I'm just going to abbreviate it as MP from here on out because I'm lazy. Deal with it. Okay? And we then force this solution Okay, through a stationary phase. Which I will abbreviate as SP. Is again, lazy. All right, deal with it. All right. You all might be familiar with this already in terms of TLC, right? In TLC, you have a plate, right, that is coated in silica gel, typically silicon oxide, right? And you spot on your compound and you dip it in a, a solution, right? You have it in a beaker that contains your organic solvent, right? Cover that with a watch glass. And over time, that spot travels up the plate, right? And you can separate out components of a mixture based on their retention factor, their RF, right? And in TLC, the RF is the distance traveled, Divided by the length run, right? And each, you know, in a under certain conditions, you know, the the RF for every spot will be unique, right? It's how you were able to analyze different anal uh, an analgesic mixture to determine the components, you know, of caffeine and so on and so forth, right? Um, that's a fairly common, you know, tool that's used, right? Um, if you've done advanced organic synthesis, you're probably also familiar with the packed silica column, right? So you have a column that is full of silica powder, which again is silicon oxide, right? Very fine crushed glass, right? And up top, you put on your your reaction mixture, right? And say it's a two component mixture because we did a simple two component reaction and we have managed to get quantitative yield, right? And you start putting in your organic solvent, right? Your mobile phase and you let that drip, right? And you catch that in an Erlenmeyer flask, right? Anna, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Over time, right, what will you end up seeing, and I'm gonna stop drawing the top and bottom of the column because, you know, I need to, okay? Is we see A start to separate from B, right? We let more time pass, more mobile phase gets fed through, A becomes its own band with respect to B, right? They start to separate from one another, okay? Until finally, A reaches the end of the column, B is probably somewhere here, right? And then eventually, out the end of our column, we get little droplets of A, and B is making its way down, 
right? And we've managed to separate A from B, okay? At this point, we say A is eluded. Okay, A is eluded from the column. So if, if once an analyte passes through the stationary phase, we call it elution. All right. All right. Now, if we were to plot this, right, if we were to plot this, make a graph, all right, and say have time down here on the x-axis, right, and we were to say maybe do uh, absorbance, right, at 240. Common for UV, right? Over time, what we would see is we would see a uh, boop. A come out there, and then sometime later, B comes out. And that is a really messy, really messy peak. So let me redraw that. Okay. And so this would be A, and this would be B, all right? And so this would be the retention time for A. This would be the retention time for B. And we measure that from time is equal to zero. This is going to be typically on the order of minutes, okay? This is our chromatogram, all right? A very basic chromatogram. Now, it has several important features, okay? It has several important features, right? Retention time. Okay. This is going to be equal to the difference in time of elution minus the time of injection, all right? So it's, it's the difference from the start of our separation, the start, to when we see that compound come out. Of the stationary. Okay. Uh, that is going to be a function of the analyte molecules interaction with the stationary. Okay. And we'll talk about, you know, more about that later on. Okay. We can also look at the peak width. Okay. So if I just draw a quick thing, right? Peak width is the total time that it takes for from the start of evolution to the end of evolution. Okay, we typically give that the, the, the letter W. Okay. All right. And then we also like to look at the width at half height. Okay. So this is the peak height. This is 50%. Okay. And we can look at that width, and we typically label that as W sub one half. Okay. So. Width. Oops. At half height. 
Okay? So I want you to bear those physical constants in mind. Okay? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but how does all this happen? How do we how do we get there? How do we get this information in the first place? Well, it all comes back to partitioning. Right? It all comes back to partitioning. And I know we discussed this a couple of weeks ago before you all started the chromatography experiments, the chromatography labs, but I want to go over it again, all right, uh, because it bears repeating. You deserve to have a thorough discussion. So let's consider a biphasic solution, right? We're going to call this phase one. We're going to call this phase two, right? And we have some sample, and it is going to equilibrate, all right, in between the two phases, right? Well, we can describe a partition coefficient, all right, as the activity of sample in phase two versus the activity of the sample in phase one. And if we assume that our activity efficient coefficients are close to unity, we can say that it's approximately the concentration in phase two divided by the concentration over phase one, okay? All right. So you all are familiar with this kind of separation, right? You did it as a liquid-liquid extraction. Back in OCHEM, right? Where you would take something and you would separate it between, say, ethyl acetate and hexanes, right? So what we can say, all right, is that the concentration, right, of S in a given phase is going to be equal, right, it's going to be equal to the moles of S in that phase divided by the volume of that phase, right? And we can also say, right, that for the sum of all the phases, right, for the sum of all the phases, it has to add up to one, right? It has to add up to one, right? Times times the total number of moles. Right? And you might be saying, well, wait a minute, hold on, Dr. C, I'm completely lost. That doesn't make any sense. All I'm saying is that you can't have, right, you can't have more than the total number of moles of the substance of the sample in any given phase, okay? So every phase has part of the total moles. That's all I'm saying, okay? That's all I'm saying, right? We wanna make it a little easier, right? We can say that the amount in a given phase, right? Right, the amount in a given phase is going to be Q, Right? Sorry, excuse me. One minus Q. Okay? One minus Q. Right? And you're like, well, what's Q? Well, Q is going to be the moles in the phase divided by total moles. Right? It's essentially a percentage. Right? 
It's a percentage. It's a fractional, fractional amount. So, how does this relate back to our partition convention? Well, if we let, if we let concentration of S sub 2 be equal to Q minus 1, I'm obsessed with putting that backwards, 1 minus Q, right? Then K can be expressed as 1 minus Q divided by, sorry, times total number of moles divided by volume of phase two divided by, okay, Q times the total number of moles divided by volume of phase one, right? Have I said anything crazy? No, I've just restated this using this expression, okay? Assuming that we only have one other phase, right? Which is our, the case in this example, okay? So, after N extractions, right? Okay, after N extractions, what we get is this expression here. All right. So we can see that the the amount of stuff extracted, all right, is equal to this expression. You can see the partition coefficient comes back to this. Right. This would be that's left left behind. All right. Left behind in phase one. And that is the basis behind chromatography. Okay? We have a partition coefficient between the mobile phase and the stationary, right? So our K is going to be our affinity for the mobile phase divided by our affinity for the stationary. Okay, and that is the basis for separation in chromatography. Let me just check time real quick. We're coming up on half an hour. I think a little bit longer. Okay, right. So we can manipulate this, right? We can manipulate this. if we have, say, phenol. Right? How can we manipulate this? Well, we could use a stationary phase that's very nonpolar. Say, 18 carbon hydrocarbon. Right? And we can use a mobile phase that's actually fairly polar, like, say, methanol. Then, our phenol will want to be in the mobile phase more than the stationary phase, and it'll come out faster, right? Compared to, say, something like bromobenzene, right? Bromobenzene's fairly nonpolar. It's going to stick to that stationary phase longer. So what we would see in our chromatogram, right, we would expect to see our phenol peak, and then we would see our bromobenzene. All right. And we'll get into more detail about that and the different types of stationary phases 
in the next video. Right? So, if you have any questions, make sure to ask. Talk to you later.